home is and make it feel better. That's right. Faith number 50 in the sweet prayer. Amen.
chapter number 22, Luke chapter number 22, here's your Bible, Luke chapter number 22, it's good to be in church tonight, it's good to be in church tonight, Luke chapter number 22, and I read two verses to you tonight, and we'll do a little bit of flipping in different places tonight, different than I normally preach, uh, but this is what the Lord's put on my heart tonight. And I pray it'll be a help to somebody. Luke chapter number 22, when you find your place, let's stand together. We'll read these verses together and then we'll bow our heads and hearts for a moment of prayer. And then you can be seated. Luke chapter number 22, look in verse number 47. <clears throat> the Bible said, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas... Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Heavenly Father, I love you tonight, and I thank you, Lord, for the blessings of God that you've given us today. Lord, I know in my heart, Lord, I've been troubled all day, Lord, about what to preach on, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd please help me tonight. Lord, I'm in dire need of a touch from another world. Lord, like only you can give, I pray that you'd cleanse me of sin and cleanse me of self. Lord, stand in a place, Lord, where I failed many times in my flesh, and I pray, oh God, that you'd please help me to help your people. Lord, most of all, I pray if somebody in our midst is lost tonight, I pray, Lord, that you'd save them by the marvelous grace of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blessings, and we'll thank you for all that you do. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated tonight. I want us to look here in this text for a few minutes, and then we'll get into the main thought uh, here in just a moment. I want to look at these th or three things that I find in these two verses uh, that I want to bring to our attention. I want us to see, first of all, that the Bible said in verse number 47, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And when I see verse number 47, I see there is an interruption. In verse number 47, we understand in the verses previous to uh, verse number 47, Jesus is went into the garden of Gethsemane. He is praying and his, his sweat becomes as great drops of blood and he is praying more earnestly that this cup may pass from him. And we understand that Jesus is praying in the garden of Gethsemane with great agony. Uh, this is not just a little prayer that he's praying maybe to. Uh, this is not just a prayer to ease his conscience. This is a prayer of agony. This this is a prayer of desperate desperation. This is a prayer of uh, desperate need. He's praying in a, uh, we know that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. He was praying as man's flesh and he was praying that 
this cup would pass from him. But then he goes on to say that he said, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, but thy will be done. And he said, it's, it's, it's of my father, that thy will be done. But the Bible tells us that when he left his disciples, he told them to pray. And when he comes back the first time from his first departure to pray, these disciples have fallen asleep. They are dozed off to sleep, leaned up against the a trunk of a tree, and these disciples are asleep. Jesus wakes them up and he said, pray that you enter in not into temptation. And the Bible said that he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. The Bible said then he came back a second time and the disciples were asleep again. And the Bible said that Jesus went on and he, he said, the Bible said in verse number 45, and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. In verse 46, and he said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. So we understand that Jesus is, he is teaching his disciples something about prayer. And I believe there's something that could be said in all of our lives concerning prayer. We all could pray a little bit more and we all could pray a little bit better and we all could pray through more. But in this text we find that there is an interruption. In verse 47 the Bible said, and while he yet spake. In other words, Brother Allen, Jesus is not done talking to his disciples. He is not finished talking to them. He is not done saying what needs to be said. But the Bible said, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. The disciples have just gotten uh, some teaching on prayer all the while falling asleep. But now this multitude has appeared according to John chapter 18 in John's account of this account in Luke 22 and John chapter 18 in verse number three. The Bible said these multitudes, they were carrying lanterns and torches and weapons. And it refers to this multitude as Judas received a band of soldiers. This band of soldiers was somewhere around 600 men. It would be around one tenth of a league. Legion, if that makes sense, well, the Bible tells us that he could have called ten th or ten legions of angels to rescue him off the cross, and uh, this these this band of men would be a a tenth of a legion, around six hundred men. But uh, there's also civilian men and women. There's also religious men and women that are uh, all on this journey to on this journey to arrest Jesus in the garden. But when we come to this text, I want you to understand that Jesus was not done speaking. The Bible says. And while he yet spake, there was more things that uh, Jesus could have said. But as he said many times before, the time is at hand. Brother Steve, what, what more could he have said about prayer that could have helped us in our Christian life? And obviously it didn't, it didn't matter as much as it would have been in our Bible had it been important uh, to us. But it's interesting to understand that there was an interruption in the garden. But I would say secondly, there's not only an interruption, but there was also an identification in verse 47. The Bible said, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. In Matthew's account, the Bible says that uh, their plot was that Judas was walk up to the Lord Jesus and kiss him on the face to signify who was to be arrested. Mark's account told the same thing. It, the plot was that Jesus was to be kissed. That would say who needs to be arrested. John's account says the same thing. But here in Luke's account, I want you to notice that there's an identification here. Judas walks up among this multitude and Jesus spots him. I believe Jesus probably spots spotted him in the darkness of the garden of Gethsemane. He knew that Judas and we know from the Passover that Judas was the one that left the Passover and he left and he went his way and that was when he went and betrayed the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and we understand that there's an identification in verse 47 that when Judas walked up Jesus knew who he was. All the disciples knew who he was but I'm telling you friend what an identification it would be when Jesus when Jesus comes back I want him to identify me as doing the work of God. I want him to identify me as doing the things of God. I want him to identify me in doing the things in the church and doing the right things. But in this identification, Jesus recognized Judas. There's a great description given when the Bible wants us to know who Judas is. Judas was a very common name in Jesus' day, but the Bible tells us that it was one of the twelve, so that's not very hard to understand who it's talking about. But thirdly, I'd like you to notice in verse 48, 
there's an intimidation. In verse 48, the Bible said, but Jesus said unto him, that's enough for me right there. But Jesus said unto him, he didn't look down at all the soldiers and all the band of men that were standing around him, but he looked right at Judas. And look what he said. Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? And I know that's a, it's a hard verse to end on, but Jesus now confronts Judas. There's a confrontation here. And I want you to understand tonight in verse 47, it mentions that he drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. And then in verse number 48, he said to Judas, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? The custom of that day, and I'm sure glad it's not custom in this day, the custom of that day, if a student met their teacher or their rabbi in this day, they would greet them with a kiss, signifying and showing their reverence and respect and thankfulness toward them for all that they had done. And we understand that Jesus, uh, he called these 12 men by, by, I mean, he called them by name. He called, I mean, he, he walked up to uh, Matthew at the receipt of customs and he said, follow me. He walked up to Peter and told him to thrust out a little from the land and one more time. And he, and he said, I'll make you fishers of men. He did the same with Andrew and John and James and all these men. But now we come to this man by the name of Judas. Outside of Simon Peter, Judas is mentioned more in the Bible than any other disciple outside of the Apostle Peter. And when we come to this, I want you to, I want you to recognize this. In Matthew chapter 10, we're given the layout of all the different disciples. Luke gives an account as well. But I want you to notice that Judas was always last in those givings of the disciples' names. And one man said it like this. He, he may have been one of the most well-known, but he had one of the worst characters of all of them. The Bible even said that Jesus said that he was a devil from the beginning. In Proverbs 27 and verse number 6, the Bible said, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You see, the, the custom was of this kiss, it was to signify respect and reverence. But Judas, this signified betrayal. It, and there was no kindness. There was no love in this, in this greeting. In Acts chapter number 1, in verse number 25, the Bible says of Judas, from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. And I want to preach for a few moments tonight on this simple thought on kissing Jesus and still going to hell. Kissing Jesus and still going to hell. I want you to look here with me tonight. Now we're going to flip around just a little bit here in, our, uh, here in the couple things that I have uh, wrote down here. But I want you to understand that you can be a part of a church and not be saved. I was thinking of that the other day, and I, I done some research on that on that on that same thought. And I was looking into this, and there was a there was a study done. And I understand tonight, before anybody is quick to judge what I'm about to say, you, you, we can judge a Christian by their fruit. According to the Bible, we can look at a Christian, brother Allen. We can see if there is fruit. If there's no fruit, he is none of his. According to the Bible, that's what it says. That's what it says. But in Acts chapter number one, we find Judas again, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But there was a recent, not recent, but there was a study done years ago, and uh, they asked all these great prominent preachers like Bob Jones Sr. and D.L. Moody, they asked these men of what they thought the average of church members that were lost. And there's some, some scary numbers. Bob Jones Sr. believed that more than 50% of church members were lost. R.G. Lee believed that more than 50% of church members were lost. Vance Havner believed 65% of church members was lost. B.R. Lakin and W.A. Criswell and Bob Gray believed 75% of church members were lost. G, uh, J. Harold Smith believed 80% 80, 80 was lost. Billy Graham, and I don't even like Billy Graham, believed that 85% of church members were lost. This is where it really gets shocking. A.W. Tozer believed that there was, A.W. Tozer and D.L. Moody and R.A. Torrey, all three believed that over 90% of church members were lost. Leonard Ravenhill, an English writer and evangelist through the years, believed that 95, maybe even up to only 2% were saved being church members. 
Now listen to me tonight. I understand that we cannot, we, we cannot judge folk by if they're saved or they're lost. God looks on the heart. I understand that tonight, but we can judge by the fruit of whether that person is saved and born again by the grace of God. And when we look at Judas's life, there's some things that can be pointed out about him that ought to be pointed out in people's lives that are church members. And, and listen to me tonight, I'm not here to beat, I'm not here to beat anybody down or make anybody doubt anything, but I want you to understand, you can be in a good church three times a week and you can read your Bible seven days a week and you can pray seven seven days a week. But that does not mean you're saved by the grace of God. The Bible tells us that salvation is by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. There's nothing that you can add on to salvation. It's by grace, and it's through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can be saved. But Judas here, I want you to see, first of all, that he was numbered. He was numbered. Go to Acts chapter number one with me tonight. Acts chapter number one. We'll see this first point on Judas was numbered. The Bible said in Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 17. Well, let's go back up to verse number 15. The Bible said in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas which was guide to them that took Jesus. Notice verse 17. Peter said, For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Judas probably was a good man. Can I say it like that? Mr. Preacher, how do you know that? He carried the money bag. I was thinking about that today, Brother Allen. If if Brother Doyle was to step down, I know Brother Doyle handles the finances around here. Brother Doyle, if you were to step down, we're not just going to let any Johnny come lately come in and take over the money of the church. We're not going to let somebody that can't be trusted over the money. Well, we're going to want somebody that's trusted. Judas was a trusted man here in Acts chapter 1. I would say he was numbered with men in verse 17 where it said, Peter said, for he was numbered with us. He was numbered in the ministry, verse 17, and obtained part of this ministry in Matthew chapter number 7. The Bible tells us of that great day at the judgment when Jesus will say, depart from me. In verse 22, he said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house up on a rock. And you may say, preacher, what does that mean? That simply means that not, not everybody that you see on Sunday mornings is saved by the grace of God. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to preach to you something that, I'm, that I've not seen before. Any man that's pastored a church any length of time, you see who may be saved and who's really lost. And I'm just trying to say to you tonight, Jesus kissed Jesus and he still went to hell. You can be a church member, you can be faithful to Sunday school, you, you may even sing in the choir, but you could still be lost. You may, you, may, uh, you may even teach Sunday school at times, Brother Stephen. You may uh, play an instrument and you may do all these sorts of things, but if you've never repented of anything, you've never possessed anything. And can I say this to you tonight? Salvation by grace through faith still requires repentance. Amen. It still requires you repenting of your sins and turning from those things and turning to Jesus. It's turn or burn. I'm telling you, friend, there's a day coming where we'll look and we'll look around all heaven for certain people and realize that they were never saved to begin with. Right. Judas, he was, a num he was numbered, but I would say secondly, he was negligent. And I'm just going to do an overview. I'm not really going to take a text for this point, but when we study about the Gospels, in the Gospels we understand there's four accounts given of the Lord's ministry. And in those four accounts, many different things. Some writers say certain things and some give different, uh, give different um, points of view and some give different uh, even occasions that Jesus was there. But uh, Judas was a negligent man. You may say, preacher, how? First of all, he was negligent of the man. You may say, preacher, how? If you study about Judas all the time, there was, a, there was a point where everybody knows the story where Mary got at the feet of Jesus and began to worship. She broke the alabaster box at his feet. 
And we, we understand that Mary was worshiping. We understand that. But Judas said, man, we could have sold that oil and got some money out of that before you just broke it and poured it out. But can I say this to you tonight? He, he, he was negligent. He, he did not understand just who that was. And can I say this to you tonight? There's a lot of people that they'll blame things on the Lord and they'll say things, well, the Lord did this and the Lord did that. But they wouldn't know the Holy Ghost or the Lord if they met him in the middle of the road. The Bible tells in the book of John that uh, concerning the sheep, he said, my sheep know my voice. They know my voice. They hearken to my voice. Though I heard a preacher preach one time, if you've never heard the voice of God, you've never been saved by the grace of God. It takes that inward conviction in your heart to understand just who he is and just who you are. I'm telling you, friend, if you ever will get saved by the grace of God, you must understand who he really is and who you really are. He was not only negligent of the man, but he was secondly negligent of the message done some research and studying on this and there was 54 times in that Jesus gave a discourse or he preached a message, he preached a sermon. One of the most well-known sermons is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the, all the Beatitudes. We, we've all heard that preached all of our lives, but I was looking and reading and studying about this and 49 of those 54 times it was a public sermon. As some of the, those other couple times was maybe in a household somewhere, maybe off somewhere by himself and maybe he just did it to certain folk. But 49 of those times that Judas probably was there. He heard the message. He heard what Jesus had to say. 60 parables are given in the word of God of Jesus uh, by Jesus' mouth. He, neglect, he was negligent of the message. You may say, preacher, what do you mean? There's been people all down through the years, Brother Allen, they've heard the gospel. They can repeat the gospel to you and me. They can, uh, they can quote you books of the Bible and quote you verses of scripture. But I'm telling you tonight, it's never got in here. It may be up here, but it's never got down into the corridors of their heart. And it's never became real to them. He was negligent of the miracles. 33 miracles are given in Jesus' in the gospel records. He ruled over nature. He raised the dead. He restored health. He removed demons. But Judas was negligent. I would say to you thirdly tonight, he was not only numbered and negligent, he was named. In Luke chapter 22 in our text tonight, he was named and first of all, it was sincere. Jesus was so sincere in Luke chapter 22 in our text tonight when he said Judas. I want you to notice that he said Judas and there's a comma. That means he paused. He, he took a break for just a moment before he finished saying what he was about to say. You can tell Brother Allen by the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ that it was a sincere. He named him. He, he called him by name. But can I say this to you tonight? Not one time in the scripture past this point do we find that Jesus ever said anything else to Judas? He was named and he was sincere. And uh, sinner friend, if you're lost tonight, the Lord is sincerely calling you. He's searching. In verse 48, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss. It was serious. There was, there was nothing else to be said here in this text. And we find in verse number, verse number 49, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, Shall we smite with the sword? One of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. We know Peter cut the man's ear off. But Stanton, I want you to understand tonight that there was a miracle that took place here that was undeserved. It was uncalled for, but Jesus did it anyway. And look, I believe it was in Matthew's account. This man that got his ear cut off, the Bible said that Jesus reached down and got his ear and put it right back on the side of his head and like nothing ever happened. I'm telling you, in the last moments of Jesus being around Judas, he was still performing miracles. He was still giving him another chance. He was still calling his name. He was still saying, Judas, don't do it. I understand tonight that Jesus knew from the beginning that Judas would betray him. Word of God had to be fulfilled. But Judas still had to make that decision. He still had to make that decision. I'll say to you lastly tonight, I know I've kind of hastened through this tonight, but this is what's on my heart. Go to Matthew chapter 27. 
Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 3. Let's read verse number 1. The Bible said, when the morning was come, give you a little context. In chapter 26, we know that Jesus has been arrested. We know that Peter has denied the Lord three times uh, leading up into chapter 27. But when we come into 20, uh, chapter 27, verse number 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Potentus Pilate, the governor. Notice verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed thee innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. Verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Notice verse 6 and 7. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put, in, put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. They took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. The Bible goes on to tell about the prophecy of Jeremy, Jeremiah. And uh, what, what I want you to understand is he was numbered, he was ne negligent, he was named, but then he was neglected. The Bible said here that in spite of what he saw, he was neglected. In, in spite of what he said, he was neglected. In spite of his silver, he was neglected. The Bible said that he saw that he was condemned. He saw that he was condemned. But the only problem with him seeing that he was condemned is that he went to the wrong person. The Bible said that he went back to where he got the money from, trying to make things right. The Bible said that when he saw it, he saw that he was condemned, he repented himself. The Bible said he tried to give the money back. They said, well, we can't put it back in the treasury because it, it's, it's got the price of blood on it. Can I say to you tonight... Peter gives us another account in Acts chapter 1. Go over there with me tonight and I'll be finished. Acts chapter 1. We know the account that the Bible says that Judas went out and hanged himself. We read verse number 17 of Acts chapter, or Acts chapter 1, verse number 17, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. I want you to really pay close attention to this next verse. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. In other words, the money that Judas brought back to them, they used that money and that purchase was named to Judas for that field. The Bible said, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Now I know that's graphic and I'm not trying to be gross or be uh, off color by any means, but that's what the Bible says happened to Judas. The Bible, one man said it like this, Brother Steve, he believed that maybe uh, he took his girdle off of his robe and maybe tied it around a tree limb and it came untied or the branch broke that he tried to hang himself on or something like that. And that, that he said he fell headlong. That means he fell head first down straight into the ground and it killed him. You may say, Preacher, what's the point you're trying to get at? I'm just trying to tell you tonight, Judas kissed the very face of the Lord Jesus Christ and still went to hell. You can be a church member. You can, be, you can tithe. I mean, you can give to missions. You can do all these sorts of things. You can, I mean, you can be a good person. I mean, there's a lot of good people in the world. A lot of good people in the world that don't know Jesus. I remember a man, and I'll, I'll say this and I'll sit down. There was a man just right down the road from here years and years ago. I always heard this all of my life. And uh, they, they always said about this man, but they say, man, he'd give you the shirt off his back. That's one of the nicest men in the neighborhood. But I remember some people here got a burden for that man because he was a lost man. He got saved at the end part of his life, but listen to me tonight. It's not worth waiting and dying and going to hell. It's not worth waiting on a deathbed repentance. It's not worth waiting on 
uh, that moment when you may not even can call on the name of the Lord. I heard a story of a preacher one time that I know very well. He was working in construction. And uh, he had been witnessing to this man for a long time that he worked with. Brother Allen, there was a day that uh, they, they were really busy. They were working on the side of the road or something. And uh, said this man, they, they were working. He was motioning for the dump trucks and the things going by. And that man accidentally got ran over by a dump truck that day. That man that had been trying to witness to him was behind the wheel of that dump truck. He said he jumped out and immediately ran over to him, trying to win him to the Lord and trying to, trying to get him to call out to God, but he wouldn't and he couldn't. And now that man's in eternity tonight. But listen to me tonight. We've watched a lot of people come in church. They sit here. They go through the motions. They sing the right songs. They read the right Bible. They listen in Sunday school. They listen to the preacher. They sing in the choir. But they may have never been saved by the grace of God. Being a good church member doesn't make you saved. Being a good Sunday school class attendee doesn't make you saved. But I'm telling you what will make you saved when you chunk your pride and you give everything you've got to the Lord Jesus Christ and make Him Lord, Savior of your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight. Sandy, if you'll come. Just a verse of an invitation. I don't know if something's been said maybe to help you tonight. Maybe somebody is lost. I, I don't know your heart. I, I, I've, I, I'm pretty scattered tonight, but that's what's been on my heart. With every head bowed, every eye closed, would anybody